Money can buy a house. It can't buy a home. Money can buy you acquaintances. It can't buy you friendships. No, I say money can buy you a clock. Money can't buy time. Money could buy me a lot of objects and a lot of vacations. But how does money give me the quality of living a life that is deeply, deeply inspirational? Without a doubt, this is one of our most phenomenal episodes to date. We were privileged to speak with Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson at his home in Muncie, originally from Crown Heights. He is so insightful. You think you know money? Think again. Enjoy this week's episode. Being a Jew? Awesome. Managing personal finances? Not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. Welcome to an episode of Kosher Money coming to you live from Muncie, New York with Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson. Welcome to your home. Thank you. (laughs) We're doing this live from his house and we appreciate your hospitality. My pleasure and honor. So this is a podcast focused on money, right? It's just dawned on me recently. Everyone has some relationship with money. You can't live. And along with money comes stresses. Do I have enough money? Do my children have a positive relationship with money? I have to pay that bill. I need a job. I need a raise. How do we go about life understanding that, but leaving behind the stresses that money brings along? So that's the million dollar question. Now the question is, will you get the million dollars to answer this question? I think the important thing to remember is, that money is a tool, a vital tool, an important tool, a useful tool, a beneficial tool, and a tool that's essential to life. But it's a tool, it's a means for an end. It's a tool to achieve a certain goal, a certain task. Never substitute the tool with life itself. I think the mistake that some of us naturally make is we go to one of two extremes. You have the ascetics who say, oh, money means nothing. I couldn't care less about money. I don't need money. I don't think about money. But often that comes back to bite them because we do need money. I need money to pay my mortgage. I need money to buy food. I need money to buy shoes. I need money to pay for tuition (laughs) and other things. You know, then there's the other extreme. Of course, I need money and I'm all about money and I'm obsessed with money and money becomes the definition of my life and my identity And it defines my moods and my serenity and my tranquility and my disposition and my character. And I think the Jewish approach is very wise in the sense it's not based on asceticism and detachment and you're a heavenly angel. Of course we need money and we work hard to generate money and money is very important in God's world to be able to achieve whatever you need to and want to achieve. But we also always remember it's not life, it's a tool for life can't create an identity. It can't destroy an identity. It cannot equal meaning and happiness. Of course, if I could pay all of my bills, it's a wonderful, wonderful blessing and it removes a major stress. But when money becomes the definition of who I am, who my children are, what my life is about, I think it will end up profoundly disappointing me. Life is about relationships. Life is about values. Life is about meaning, purpose, love, connection. Money, if it's used as a tool to achieve these things and bring us closer to these things, amazing. If not, it can be quite an intense distraction. Cultures outside of Jewish circles many times focus heavily on money, that it's a an end to an end. It's the goal, right? I'm a millionaire. I'm a billionaire. You know, I think the only connection I have to billionaire is I have bills. I don't know if that makes me a billionaire. All that said, how do we instill that when our children are seeing such, not just mixed messaging, they're seeing messaging coming from the other side that wealth is a goal. And 
money is an end goal? How do we combat that actively so that the generations after us and even ourselves realize that? And, and it's very good when you're saying it and it makes sense, but how do we instill that into our daily lives? Yeah. I have the privilege of meeting lots and lots of people. I travel the world. I think I've visited six or seven hundred communities, universities, synagogues, Jewish centers, non-Jewish centers, and spoke to audiences, I would say, from all affiliations and communities, Jews and non-Jews, religious and secular. And I've had the opportunity and the privilege to meet people of different brackets, financial brackets, and demographics, sometimes people who are extremely, extremely wealthy, or people who are wealthy, well-to-do, as well as people who are struggling financially. And it's so telling to me that sometimes you meet a person with a lot, a lot of money, but they're worked out. They have what you call character. They have an identity. They know who they are. They know who they're not. The definition of their dignity is not their money. The validation that people will give them because of the money does not make up who they are vis-a-vis -vis themselves, their spouses, their children. And sometimes you meet people who also have a lot of money and the levels of insecurity and anxiety and self-consciousness is so toxic that I almost feel bad for them. And don't get me wrong, I'm not from the group that says you don't need money, you should have, everybody should have a lot of money because money can be very, very useful and beneficial and allows you to do a lot of good and great and fun and productive and holy things. But if anybody makes the mistake of thinking that money equals a good life, they are in for a great disappointment. Not because money can't give you a lot of comforts, it can, and it should, but because there's no substitute for working on yourself. There's no substitute for self-awareness. There's no substitute for dealing with your wounds, your broken places, your fears, your insecurities, your traumas of dealing with your darkness, your skeletons, your toxicity. No money in the world will eliminate that. And that's where life happens. When I'm a worked out person, when I refine my character, when I confront those things that scare me most, when I'm ready to deal with my darkness, then money becomes an incredible blessing. And if not, like every great gift in the world, it can become also a source of much deeper insecurity, much more alienation from people, much more jealousy, and much more psychological problems and even misery. Seeing those in circles where there is less money and seeing those in circles where there's an abundance of money, what do you see as, and I think you've touched on this, but I'd like to hone in on it. What do you see as the, the secret to happiness, assuming that it's not money that creates happiness? Yeah. Well, it's important to say this. If somebody has no money, if they can't put bread on the table, if the children don't have what they need, if I can't pay my rent or my mortgage, obviously it's a very big stress in life. So when people say money has nothing to do with happiness, you know, and you, you could be broke and be the happiest person, you know, I think it's important to be realistic. You know, if I'm stressed out and anxious because the bank is coming after me and all of my <coughs> credit card companies are coming after me and I simply can't cover, you know, the month, it, 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 it's stressful. And therefore, we should try to do whatever we can with the grace of God to be able to enhance our sources of revenue. And, uh, you know, that's hard. It's hard to make a living today is difficult. But I think it's important to understand that there's a big difference between eliminating the stress of having a lot of bills that I can't cover and really living a quality life that is saturated with depth and love and meaning and purpose. That life cannot be bought through money. You know, money can buy a house. It can't buy a home. Money can buy you acquaintances. It can't buy you friendships. 
No, I say money can buy you a clock. Money can't buy time. Money could buy me a lot of objects and a lot of vacations, but how does money give me the quality of living a life that is deeply, deeply inspirational and meaningful? And here is where a person really needs to cultivate deep self-awareness, values, meaningful and spiritual goals, relationships, a relationship with yourself, a relationship with people you trust, people who trust you, a relationship with your loved ones, a relationship with your mind, with your soul, with your God, and be involved in a life that gives your, makes your heart start dancing. And then, when my money is used to further and enhance these goals, the money itself becomes part of happiness. But if it becomes self-contained, you know, money as money as money, it, it becomes pathetic. <laughs> they tell an old joke about a Jew. He was very wealthy. And he also considered himself brilliant. He wasn't so brilliant. He just had mazel. He was wealthy. He had good luck. In any case, people would come to him because they wanted loans. But he didn't like lending and he didn't like giving charity. He loved giving people advice because he thought he was brilliant. So people were smart and they started to come to him for advice. And in the process, they managed also to get a loan, <laughs> to get a gift, to get some charity for him. And that's how it worked. After a number of years, unfortunately, he lost all his wealth. And people stopped coming to him. So he turns to one of his friends. He says, I don't understand. I understand they stopped coming to me for loans. But I'm still a smart person. Why did they stop coming for advice? <laughs> he never realized why they were coming to him for advice. I remember there was a very wealthy man who phoned me once. And uh, he asked me if I could listen to a speech that he gave at some huge event. I said, why? He says, I want to hear objective feedback. I said, why are you asking me? He said, I'll tell you the truth, because any speech I give, when I leave, the people around me say, that was brilliant, that was mesmerizing. We never heard such brilliance. He says, <laughs> for some reason, my speeches are always brilliant and flawless. You think it has to do with the money? <laughs> 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 you know, I didn't want to uh, spill all the beans, but the point is people are so desperate for authenticity. And the fact is when people with a lot of money come into a room, you'll see that people change. Mm. They become intimidated, not even consciously. Subconsciously, they start behaving differently. They want to leave a good impression, even if the person is actually not helping you. But the fact that this person has so much money, I look around the room and everybody is different. You know, I have a photo in my home of the Lubavitcher Rebbe on Tisha B'av, which is the Jewish saddest day in the calendar, the day that both of our temples were destroyed in Jerusalem. It's in August, the ninth of the month of Av. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Endel Schneerson, is sitting on a lower box, which is our custom on that day of mourning. We don't sit on a regular chair. We sit on lower chairs or on a, on a cardboard box or a milk box. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe is sitting on a box and he's reading the Book of Lamentations by Jeremiah the prophet that was written during the destruction of the Holy Temple by the Babylonians in Jerusalem. And you see the Lubavitcher Rebbe from an angle. It's hanging right here in my dining room. And people ask me, why did you chose this photo to hang up in your dining room? It's a sad day, it's a sad picture. And I tell them the story that the photographer of the Rebbe, his name was Vyshinsky, he was a Russian artist. and. Uh, we once asked him, he was at our table, we once asked him, what is your favorite photo? You took thousands of photos of the Rebbe. And he said, this one. I said, why? And he said, look at the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Would you ever guess that as I took this photo, 6,000 people were looking at him? I said, no. He said, that's the beauty of this photo. He's immersed in his prayers and in his poetry and in the Book of Lamentations, you don't know that the 6,000 eyes gazing at him. You would never guess from the picture. So I told over the story in the synagogue on Saturday, and the next day somebody bought me the photo as a gift. So I hung it up in my dining room. My point is, I can't say we're all on that level, but we have to cultivate a consciousness of realizing I can't live for other people, and I can't live to please other people. 
And if somebody with money or with some other great blessing walks into the room and suddenly I find my behavior changing, suddenly I'm calculating every word that comes out of my mouth, which is very normal. This, this is how human beings are. But it's important to identify this weakness that we have, you know, how we sometimes lose ourselves completely when, authentic, when it really this person may be much less wise than you. And what is more important, this person is desperately craving authenticity and authentic relationships. It's sometimes very hard for rich people. One of them told me, he says, I don't have friends. I'm always suspecting that the next friend just wants my money. He says, I can't have friends. And it's, 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 it's so sad. People are really craving authentic relationships. So yes, it's normal. A guy with a lot of money comes into the room and it's impressive and it's nice. And you know what? Identify that. But to, to become completely enslaved by it and defined by it and as though there's nothing else to life and identity, I think is very demoralizing for us and our children learn from that. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, a word from Kolel Chabad. What is it like when you can't afford heat? The cold seeps into your bones. It hurts to put your foot on your own bedroom floor. You shiver in your home more than when you're outside. Most Americans don't realize that Israeli apartments are built of stone with concrete floors. Heaters and radiators are not included. It's especially freezing in cities like Yerushalayim and in the northern city of Tzfas. Fatherless families, forgotten Holocaust survivors, lonely seniors, the abandoned people who fall through society's cracks. These are Israel's poorest, and these are who Kolo Chabad helps. It's a Rameer Balanes charity in the Holy Land for over 200 years. Please help our friends in Eretz Yisrael all across Israel. They need our help. Visit kolochabad.org slash kosher money and please give from the bottom of your heart. Now back to this week's episode. I imagine those hearing that it's not that the rich are, are looking for sympathy because if uh, someone who didn't have money had the opportunity to exchange their problems and challenges with someone who's putting his head on his pillow that's maybe worth $400 and super comfortable at night, he would think, oh, I would exchange those. The, you know, I don't know who my friends are. You know, that's that's your big challenge. You know, I'm struggling to, to pay the tuition. So as someone who's seen it side by side, there are unique challenges that are presented with both sides of the spectrum, right? I think that somewhat gets lost on someone who may not have money, that there are real challenges sure. as it relates to that. Sure. Every gift, every gift that God gives us also has a downside. Every opportunity comes with challenges. Every talent, people who are very smart, people who are very sensitive, people who have a lot of courage, people who are empaths, people who are deep. There's a line in Proverbs, more perceptiveness, more pain. Money is a gift. It comes with a set of tremendous blessings and opportunities that are positive and challenges. Marriage is a gift. It has its challenges. Children are the greatest gift in life. But it comes with challenges. Raising children is not easy. Sometimes it's easier not to have children. But we crave to have children because of the gift. Money is a great gift and a great opportunity, but you have to be aware of its challenges. The challenges of how it affects my personality, how it affects my relationship with myself, my spouse, my God, how it affects my children, how it affects my friendships, what it does to me emotionally and psychologically. You know, the moment I don't have a real God and money becomes a substitute for God, I could become a dangerous person. So self-awareness is so important, and there's no substitute for it. And I should say, you know, living in a big, comfortable, beautiful home, going on beautiful vacations, taking a private plane wherever you have to go, is a blessing. It's a blessing. I know I travel through regular airports and airlines, and when so once in a while a friend of mine gives me a, <laughs> a trip, a free trip on a private plane, I see the comfort. But sometimes you walk into a small house, you know, with a few bedrooms, but there's a good marriage. 
and the father and the mother are connecting with the children. They all know how to sit on the floor and play Monopoly together or Shmuas. They sit around the table and they know how to sing without self-consciousness, without fear. People respect each other. They're here for each other. They could be open with each other. These are the priceless gifts of life. And I have to know that if I have a room with 17 bedrooms and 14 bathrooms and my own tennis court and my own baseball field and my own basketball field and an indoor pool and an outdoor pool and a solar jacuzzi on the roof, amazing, wonderful, enjoy. But this will not make your marriage thrive. This will not make you have an amazing relationship with your children. This will not help you confront your skeletons and traumas. <laughs> so these are important things to understand. Unless I use the money to get the help I need. <laughs> and the work that I have to put in to be able to deal with the things I have to deal with. Let's talk deeper on the connection between money and God. You mentioned the Lubavitcher Rebbe and... He has a quote on what it says on money. Let, let's talk about that. And to piggyback off that, what sh how should we be thinking about God as it relates to the money, trusting in him that he would provide the, the amount of work we need to do without overdoing it versus believing and trusting in God that he will provide us? Yeah, the Lubavitcher Rebbe would often point out that uh, the American dollar has those words, in God we trust. You know, they say a joke that there was a store in Borough Park in Brooklyn with a big sign, in God we trust, everyone else pay cash. So for the Rebbe that meant a lot because if God can't relate to money, then ultimately God can often become a meaningless word. You know, if God only relates to abstract, transcendent, spiritual, heavenly, celestial truths, it's great. But as we say, you know, can I take God to the bank? You know, does God count where money counts, where things matter? Money is the symbol of the real world, the physical world, the world of commerce, the world of business. Not the world of abstractions, not the world of ideas, not the world of philosophy or religion, but the real, real world. You know, people can debate whether God exists or doesn't exist, but they don't debate if money exists or doesn't exist because that touches us in a very visceral way. It allows me to buy my food and buy my drinks and survive. So for Judaism, connecting God to the world of money is not just nice, but it's critical. Do I have a God when it comes to money? In other words, do I have priorities and values and morality and moral boundaries and sensitivity and red lines that I won't cross even when there's a lot of money at stake? And it makes all the difference because in the world of money, especially when you're advanced, you know, I have a friend, he works in New York, and I looked at him one day, and I said, what happened to you? He said, Rabbi, why, why, I deal with sharks all day. And if you want to deal with sharks, you have to become a shark. It was so sad. I understood him. And I looked at him, <laughs> and I said, but what all the sharks are really yearning for is for someone to teach them that they don't have to reduce themselves to sharks. Be a leader. Be a leader in your industry. You'll make more money. You won't make less money. I said, people have souls. People are craving happiness. People yearn for real relationships. All these people are in therapy because something is going s sour for them in their lives. Be a source of inspiration. Teach them how money can become an experience and a tool for bringing more love into the world, more light, more hope, more caring. You know, I have to tell you something. When I was a boy, I was 15 years old. I grew up in Brooklyn at the feet of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And I still remember he would have a Saturday afternoon gathering, a Shabbat gathering, 1.30 for a few hours. And it was one week, I still remember, was the portion of Noach, that's in Genesis, the end of 1989. And uh, he spoke, 
and he spoke about charity. And at the end, he said, I want to suggest something. The Lubavitcher Rebbe then was close to 90. He was in his high 80s. He says, what I want to suggest is, in order to encourage the ideals and the values of charity in the world, I want to suggest that every school, every school and every business, Friday, before the employees, before the students go off for the weekend, the principal or the manager or the CEO or the teacher should give every child and every employee an extra gift, whether it's a nickel, a dime, a quarter, a dollar, ten dollars, and say, in addition to your wage, in addition to your salary, this is for you to give to charity. So if a company has a hundred employees, you get your paycheck, and here is an extra amount of money. He said, first of all, imagine how many millions of people will be giving charity and how many millions of people in need will be helped. But in addition to that, it creates a paradigm shift. It creates a consciousness. Every student knows that he or she received a gift to give to charity. Every employee knows you got your salary, you're going home with your check, or if they wire the money, whatever. This was 89, so people were still giving checks. But in addition to that, you're getting something for charity. And he said, this way we can create a global transformation where people look at charity from a different perspective. You know, I thought, wow, this is, this is leadership. This is, this is global thinking. Now, I don't think that the Rebbe's idea was implemented, at least in a serious way. Um, I don't even know if many people know about this, but I heard this from his mouth, and it was, it was, I, was, I, was, I was a teenager. I was 15 years old, 14 or 15 years old. It left such an impact on me because this showed how a leader thinks. You know, when you're in the industry of making money, instead of becoming a victim of the circumstances and a victim of the culture, you display leadership by displaying integrity, authenticity, by teaching people what to do with money, how to deal with money, how instead of allowing money to control their heads and get to their heads, the money actually becomes a tool for, yes, for living comfortably and for doing great things and for enjoying life. And then for what ultimately counts for all of us, which is to create a world that is filled with, with compassion, that is filled with empathy, that is filled with, with hope and love. Shmuel Shaiwitz, welcome back to the studio. You're now involved in helping the OU's Living Smarter Jewish, which assists people of all kinds with their money. What are you seeing out there? Give us, give us a story. So, yeah, it's a great honor to be able to work with them. They're doing so much to help people, especially in this environment. A lot of people are concerned about financial stability, uh, employment, and, and what goes on in their home. And I think um, what I've noticed and what I've been saying to a lot of my clients is the fact that it's not just about checking to see if your income and your expenses tie out at the end of the month and whether you're making a little bit more money than, than you're spending. Um, my recommendation to people is to look at it in a three tier approach, which is your money, your mindset and the meaning. And you kind of need all three of these to be balanced and at least collaborated in order for it all to work. If you have a terrible mindset about things, you probably will not be driven to make more money than you can. And if you don't have meaning in your life and you're just doing it purely to make money, then same thing. The money will not follow and, and money is a tool as we're learning and I can't wait to hear the rest of this episode with Rabbi Waiwai, because part of it is having the full holistic view about the money, the mindset, and the meaning. And to that extent, I have a people could check out proofunding.com forward slash small. I have a little WhatsApp group that I've created that people could join, get a little tips on all those three. Awesome. We'll put that link in the show notes, proofunding.com slash small. Love the personal uh, touch there. And now back to this week's episode. Do you find that as a society we're overworking and trying to make as much money as we could? I would imagine that has to do with the advancements of technologies and our work is in our pockets and wherever we go and used to be nine o'clock we walk into the office, five o'clock it closes and then you're off for the next uh, 16 or so hours. What are your thoughts on the idea yeah. of overworking? I, th I think every person is different, but I think you're touching on something that's very serious. And for some of us, it's even more serious than others. 
I met a fellow the other day, and his marriage was falling apart. He got divorced now. And I was trying to help save his marriage. And I said, why do you, uh, why do you have to be 16 hours a day in the office? <laughs> why don't you come home early? You have three kids. Spend time with your wife, with your kids, four kids. And he looks at me, and he says, you know, my entire life, I felt like I am a piece of garbage. I amount to nothing. I am valueless. And every day in the office, I work very hard so that everybody should feel that they need me. So that everybody should feel that I am essential and indispensable and vital to this company. I have to work there 16 hours a day. Now I have to say, his self-awareness and honesty was inspiring. Because what he was basically saying is, a lot of the time I'm spending in the office is not to do work. It's not even to make money. It's to numb my emotional pain or fill a psychological void or a bottomless pit of a lack of self-love, self-respect, self-compassion that I don't have since three years old. And I'm trying to use the office and the money to compensate for that. We have to be aware of all of these patterns. We say, I'm overworking because I have so many bills to pay. That may be true. It may also be true. It's a very good escape from my house. I don't have to deal with my marriage. I could come home and not deal with my children. It's a way of finding soothing, numbing experiences that make me feel productive in society without dealing with what I have to deal with. But this is a very personal journey. You have to ask yourself, why are you really working so hard? And can't you take some more time to focus on that which you're working towards? <laughs> the money and the work is a means towards an end. So maybe let's focus a little bit on the end. You know, they used to say an old joke, right? Somebody once said, a Jewish comedian, he said, my mother always served leftovers. We're still looking for the original. You know, we're always more work and more work and more work. And when does it stop? There's a beautiful description in, my, in Maimonides. Maimonides was one of the greatest Jewish leaders, physicians, philosophers, and codifiers. He lived in the 12th century. He was the private doctor of the Sultan in Egypt, Saladin and his successor. And Maimonides concludes his magnum opus of Jewish law. He says, there's going to come a time in history when we will have managed to eliminate hunger, war, jealousy, and competitiveness because goodness will be so abundant and all of the delicacies will be as common as dust and earth. And when you read these words of Maimonides, it's like, wow, artificial intelligence, solar energy. There comes a time when 95% of jobs will be able to be executed by artificial intelligence. And everybody's going to ask, why am I here? What am I doing? And when we manage to get the resources, you know, electricity from the sun, et cetera, et cetera, without the bills that we have to pay now. So Maimonides says, what is the world going to do? And he says, the answer is at that time, the entire universe, all of human civilization will be immersed in divine awareness, connecting to cosmic oneness and developing and dedicating the day and the night to connect to the infinite oneness at the core of existence. You read these words and you actually see where history is going. And where history is going is I have to ask myself, am I focusing on that which really really, really is eternally meaningful. Yes, we have to work hard. There's a lot of bills to pay. Sometimes people are overworked and underpaid and stressed out. And every person, of course, should try to enhance their financial situation as best as possible. But we should never forget that with all these circumstances, it is so important to focus on attachment attachment. I was very impressed. I was not long ago with my wife in Mexico for a few days for lectures. And I saw they invited us for lunch. And I saw that the whole family came together for lunch. And I said, how often do you do this? They said, every single day. <laughs> the grandparents, the parents. I said, every day you all eat lunch? Yeah, we all eat lunch. And nobody used their phone by lunch. And 
I'm sure that society has other challenges and flaws. I don't want to romanticize any particular city or country. My point is attachment is where it's at. Children need attachment, attachment, attachment. They need the four S's. They need to feel safe, secure, seen, soothed. I can't buy that for money. With money, I can buy video games <laughs> and buy you know, screens and tablets and get other people to take care of you and look after you so I could sit on my phone and watch other videos. Attachment can only happen by me looking into your eyes and you looking into my eyes and us connecting verbally or silently with our emotions, with our hearts, with our minds, with our arms, with our legs. And when we lose touch of the value and importance of that, we're stripping ourselves of the gifts that make us who we are, that mold us into the people that then know how to live. So I wanna make a living that's important, but making a living should never be confused with life itself. <laughs> we touched on charity a few times already in this conversation, and we'd be remiss by not mentioning, if we didn't mention, just how many organizations and the infusion of monies that are being pumped into these organizations from people who are just giving and, and our communities are, are, are so powerful as a result of that giving. What is it about charity that, and, and I understand it just brings us together and, and it helps support other people, but it's, it's almost like a core fabric of our lives and, and we're commanded to, to be charitable. Um, charity as a topic is something that we're doing great with, but what would you like to see that we can, you know, and I, I know you mentioned the Lubavitcher Rebbe's idea, and which I'd love to see organizations take that in a very meaningful way. What would you like to see that can just really even further jumpstart the efforts that are, are, you know, core fabrics of our community as it relates to charity? Yeah. Charity is part of the DNA of Judaism and of the Jewish people. The founder of Judaism was Abraham, and Abraham was the embodiment of giving, of loving kindness, of charity, of philanthropy, together with his wife Sarah and the next generation, Rebecca and Isaac, and they imbued it. It's almost a genetic mutation, like they imbued it into the DNA of their children. Jewish communities and individuals are built on charitable institutions, on the ideals of charity, the values of charity, it's a big reason of why we survived and how we survived. If we would have all been individuals and isolated and you take care of yourself, I'll take care of myself, which sounds very capitalistic and sometimes very nice, I don't think we could have survived as a people. We always looked out for each other. We always had the courage to say, you're my brother, you're my sister, even if you're not my biological brother and sister. Um, I've compared our history to the sequoias. If you go to San Francisco and you check out the sequoias, the redwoods, some of those trees are 3,500 years old, 4,000 years old. And a few years ago, scientists were trying to figure out the secret of their longevity. How did they weather all the storms and tsunamis? And they thought that the roots must be very deep, maybe 50 or 100 feet. How astounded they were to see that the roots of the sequoias are very shallow. But what they lack in depth, they make up in breadth the sequoia's roots begin to expand, and when they encounter the roots of another sequoia, they become entangled and interconnected and interlaced. So you can have 50 trees on top of the surface, they're different, but underground, the roots are interconnected. And I realized we are the redwoods of history. <laughs> what the sequoias understand naturally, the Jewish people understood conceptually and emotionally. On top of the ground, we're all different people. But on a deeper level, we really need to be here for each other. We, need to, we don't always have to agree with each other. We have to be able to support each other and, and remain interconnected and interlaced and realize that we're one. And my happiness will not come from dismissing you. If I want to win, you have to win. And if you want to win, I also have to win. 
we're in this together. It's like in a marriage. You can't be victorious if your wife feels hopeless and, and a woman can't feel triumphant if her husband feels hopeless. It's, it's, it's team effort. And I think it is so important for us to encourage it. A major amount has been accomplished in this area. Um, the Jewish community, thank goodness, uh, excels in, in, in charity and philanthropy. What I do think is that we often have to think not about where I want to give only, but what is really needed. For example, if you take the world of education, the world of education in the Jewish community is a very, very challenging world. Families have lots of children. Tuition grows from year to year. And there are people who can't, they feel they can't have more children because they can't pay tuition. So I think we have to put our minds together and focus not only on where I want to give charity, but also what are the real needs of the community? What are the real challenges to battle? And really put our souls and pockets and wallets into those goals and initiatives that will really make a difference for a new generation. Sometimes it's comfortable to give money in places that are just my comfort zone. But you know what? Nobody needs that. Nobody needs that. So that's what I would think. We need to really focus on absolute needs of our future, of our community, and communities, and uh, and strategize about how to help. That's very interesting. A word from a sponsor, Infinity Land Services. If you are involved in any sort of real estate transaction and you are looking for a title without the story, without the drama, look up our friends at Infinity Land Services, ilstitle.com. And here's a special commercial from our friends at Infinity Land Services. So, uh, funny story. It's a long story. <sighs> What's his story? Tune in for the top story. This is just the start of the story. At the front lines of this story. When it comes to closing on a property, you don't want a story. You want a title. At Infinity Land Services, we've been helping you close real estate transactions with confidence for over 20 years. No drama, no excuses, no stories. You talk about the redwoods and the roots it's just interesting to think that after the Holocaust, the Jewish nation rebuilt, but rebuilt so quickly and with, with a vibrance where, if you had to guess, it maybe would have taken hundreds of years and, and it's, it was done in mere decades. Does that speak to the, the oneness and the togetherness of, of our people that we were able to bounce back with such a vengeance? Absolutely. I think there's two qualities that have defined the Jewish people for time immemorial. One is the quality of resilience, faith, commitment, dedication, hope. And the second one is unity. And I think those two qualities saved our nation time and time again. It begins with Jacob. The Bible in Genesis says that Jacob was attacked in the middle of the night by an adversary who tried to kill him and then maimed him and made him limp. And then when morning came, this mysterious enemy wanted to leave and Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And this has become the mission statement of the Jewish people. When an adversary attacks you, when an enemy attacks you, wants to kill you, don't just get rid of him. You look him in the eyes and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. I must emerge from this encounter more blessed, more empowered, more deep, more authentic, more creative. So the Jewish people, whenever they faced crisis, tragedy, even a tragedy like the Holocaust, which was unfathomable, they didn't just say to themselves, okay, it's over, let's move on. 
we're going to learn from this experience and create an unprecedented renaissance and rejuvenation, as in JEW, and unleash a creativity that was never before. That resilience has been one of the greatest blessings of the Jewish people. 1945, they were liberated from Auschwitz, and the next day, Jews went to rebuild Israel. And today, almost half of the Jewish nation is living in our homeland since the days of King Solomon. Understand what I'm talking about. You're talking about almost 3,000 years. We have not had a situation where half of the Jewish people are living in their homeland. Because already towards the end of the first temple era, 10 tribes were exiled and assimilated. During the second temple, most Jews remained in Iraq and Iran, Babylonia. And for the rest of history, we were scattered all over the world. How did this happen? This happened because every day, 60 times a day, Jews mentioned Jerusalem. Three times a day, they prayed in the direction of Jerusalem, even when they were living on the other end of the world and never hoped of getting back there. That sense of hope and resilience and faith was instrumental, but it couldn't happen without camaraderie, without strong families and strong communities. We simply could not do it on our own. And uh, in fact, it's also in the Bible, Moses goes out the first day in Egypt and he sees an Egyptian beating a Jew to death. And Moses kills the murderer and he saves the Jew. The next day he goes out, he sees two Jews fighting and he says, how do you do this? And those are the first two stories about the first Jewish leader. We have to be able to stand up for each other. We have to be able to protect each other. And we have to avoid infighting because when we are... When we are divisive and when we start loathing each other and not trusting each other, we don't only destroy other people, we destroy ourselves. Our greatest calamities have befallen us as a result of internal mistrust, of internal alienation. This doesn't mean we must agree with each other. That would not be Jewish. We, we have a robust tradition of disagreeing of arguing, of disputations, of debates. The entire Talmudic culture is based on arguments. Thousands of pages in the Mishnah and the Talmud, you'll be working very hard to find one page without arguments. We're always we're arguing about everything, arguing what God wants and what the law is and what's the best way to live. We talk and argue about everything. But arguments are not bad. Arguments don't mean we don't trust each other. Arguments mean we trust each other enough that we can share a differing opinion without feeling that the other person will just dismiss us and hate us. In a good marriage, there's not less arguments. There's as many arguments as in a bad marriage, but they know how to argue. The husband and the wife both trust that the other one could listen to my opinion without stonewalling me, without gaslighting me, without displaying contempt. That's the power of a good marriage. And that's the power of a people, of a nation. We can disagree, but we could lean on each other. We can trust each other. We can love each other. And practically, we can help each other. I have to say this, you know, the, the Torah, the Bible, prohibits Jews to lend money to other Jews on interest, which is a fascinating law. It's not a civil law. It's not a law in business because interest is a normal way of, rene- of, 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 of generating revenue, right? I give you my car. I give you my car for a year. I expect to get rent. I give you my house for five years. I expect to get rent. I gave you my money for 10 years as a loan. Why can't I take some rent? Interest is not evil. The Torah acknowledges that it's not immoral. But the Torah wanted that Jews should treat each other in an extra special way, like brothers and sisters. You give a loan without interest, and we know the Merchant of Venice. uh, William Shakespeare wrote a whole play about Shylock, which portrayed the Jews as nasty, self-centered moneylenders because there was a time when Christianity would not allow Christians to lend each other on interest. So the Jews had to become the money lenders. The Jews have to, be, to become the bankers. And it was always nasty. But the point is, this is a fascinating mitzvah that even though taking interest is a very legitimate way, I'm not talking about interest that kills the other person, but interest is a legitimate way of making a couple of dollars. <laughs> I could have used the money for myself. I gave it to you, so give me some money for that. Give me some extra money. And yet between the Jewish people, the Torah prohibited it. Until today, 
in every Jewish community, there's what's called gemilat gemach, gemilas chesed. There's an interest-free fund where people can borrow $1,000, $5,000, $10,000 to make a wedding, to make a bar mitzvah, to start a business, to help with a down payment. But this is a fabulous, fabulous, you can't always go to the bank or go to some professional lender, but this is a fa fascinating institution within communities that have been going on already for 3,000 years. A lot of people don't know about this. If you need $3,000, you can call somebody. Sometimes they want a guarantor and you can get it for six months or for a year. And, um, and, and you don't have to, you could pay it back without any interest. It's just a fabulous institution that is not in, in the code of the Jewish law. It's not in the section of civil law and monetary business known as Chosh and Mishpat because it's not a business commandment. From a business point of view, it's ethical. It's actually in another section, same section like the laws of kosher. It's more ritualistic, Yeridea, because it's about the familial relationship that Jews needed to cultivate with each other throughout the generations to survive and thrive. Phenomenal. For those that are watching that have never heard of Rabbi Waiwai, you were born today to them. What? Born again Jew. <laughs> born again Jew. Where can they go to consume more of you? They, wanna, they want their daily share of Rabbi YY. What can they do? I know you're all over YouTube. Is there a specific channel, a website, books you've written? So there's a YouTube channel with my name, Rabbi YY Jacobson. They could subscribe to it and get much of the information. There's a website with all my classes called theyeshiva.net. We'll T-H-E y-e-s-h-i-v-a dot net so so uh, spotify this podcasts one that can subscribe to and on the inter on our website the yeshiva dot net you could subscribe to a a weekly uh, email newsletter with my essays and articles and other uh, materials we offer is there a contact tab if someone did want to reach yes, out yes there's a contact tab there and they can reach out i imagine you get Hundreds of correspondences. Over the uh, I am sighing because that's true. And I'm a little embarrassed to say, but I have, I'm behind 10,000 emails oh because I get a few, I can get, I can get 200 a day and they're not easy questions. Uh, so I try hard. I have some help, but uh, it's hard to keep up because people do reach out from all over the world. And, um, you know, many emotional questions and philosophical questions and psychological questions. You know, we live in a generation where people are searching for themselves and they're searching for authenticity and they're searching to heal, to heal from anxiety and from, from trauma and from depression and from alienation. People are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Uh, there were generations when we tolerated it, we repressed it, we suppressed it. We put one foot ahead of another foot and just marched on. But today I think people are sick and tired of, of, of being miserable. Uh, I think we want, I think it's a beauty of a generation. You know, people say we're spoiled, we have enough money to think about our emotions. Mm -hmm. People say, you know, 50 years ago, after the Holocaust, 70 years ago, nobody had a penny to their name. Our parents or grandparents came off the boat and many of them had one quarter in their pocket. One nickel. Now, then you could have still bought stuff with a quarter, even a nickel. Uh, but who had money? And now, 70, 80 years later, everyone has money. A lot, not everybody, a lot of people have money. So now you could afford therapy. You could deal with emotions all day. You could get angry at your mother. You could not like your father. You can hate your brother. You don't like the rabbi. It's the luxury that allows people to deal with emotions. My grandmother, she had to survive. Who could deal with emotions? There may be truth to that. But you know what? That may be a divine gift. There comes a generation where God says, you know what? I'm going to eliminate the misery of day-to-day -day desperation trying to survive so that you could deal with your emotions, so that you could focus on your inner life, so that you could enhance your identity. Sure, it could become narcissistic and, and self-indulgent, and it becomes about worshiping every feeling. Again, like every gift, like money, like every gift. <laughs> every gift can be misused and, and misdirected and abused. Or you could use the time and the energy to learn more and study more and grow more and, and connect more and pray more and, uh, and find your soul in, in, in a much deeper way. 
any books out from Rabbi Waiwei? No. Hebrew, when? Hebrew, I have a Hebrew book yeah. called The Secret of Exile and Redemption. No <laughs> so English. Uh, no, no, not English. yet. <laughs> is, is that in the, in the plans at yeah, some point? Yeah, it's in the dreams. What would be the title? What, what book, what, what topic speaks to you? I mean, you, you have lectures on practically every topic. It's, it's fascinating. And this was an amazing, amazing conversation. I hope to do many more with you in the future. Bezra Sashem. But if, if there was that one book, like that dream book, what, what, what's, what topic really speaks to you? I think, I think really empowering ourselves and others to see ourselves for who we really are as divine ambassadors of love and light and hope of people having the courage to be able to embrace their consciousness and be able to truly live lives that are aligned with their deepest core and live from within, becoming a channel for God's glory that's manifested in each person. You know, to empower people to live that life is very meaningful for me. That's what I try to do for myself and others. Publishers, take note. Uh, I'm sure they come after <laughs> you, you, knock it on the door and all that. But thank you. Thank you so much for your time. We'll put uh, the links and the, the mentions of, of uh, other work that you've done, your YouTube channel, in the show notes for those that want to consume more. And we cannot thank you enough for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Kosher Money. I cannot believe we are in the 40s. 40 plus episodes are in the bag. Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson, look him up. He is on YouTube. Phenomenal videos almost on the daily, if not every day. Really, really insightful individual. He is a force to reckon with. And we are privileged and thankful that he allowed us to get a glimpse of his wisdom. Thank you to our friends, livingsmarterjewish.org. If you need financial guidance, a coach, an individual, someone to speak to free of charge, visit livingsmarterjewish.org. Thank you to our friends at Mishpacha Magazine. Our interviews, our episodes, now feature bonus content in the Mishpacha Magazine in their Money Talks column. Really excited about that. You can watch bonus video content at mishpacha.com where you'll see not just a recap of this episode, but content and questions you want to ask that Mishpacha is assisting us with and doing a fantastic job. So shout out to the team at Mishpacha. Thank you to our sponsors, Infinity Land Services, ApprovedFunding.com, and Kolal Chabad. Some people say, why is it charity sponsoring? They're not. A fan of Kol Chabad is making this happen and wants to tell the world about this amazing organization. So thank you to our sponsors. If you want more shows, more content for the Orthodox Jewish family and beyond, visit livinglechaim.com. My brother Yaakov has many shows. He has a mental health show. He has Inspiration for the Nation, where he talks to impactful people on the weekly. Charlene Amanoff has a podcast for the Jewish girl, the Jewish mom, the Jewish woman, fantastic content. He has more in the works. Can't give too much away. That's Yaakov Langer of Living L'Chaim. And we are appreciative to be on his network. I am Ellie Langer, the host of Kosher Money. If you have suggestions, visit livinglechaim.com. Slitch? Slitch? That's not even a word. Click on the suggestion tab and tell us what you like what you don't like, what you want to hear. We want guest suggestions. Some of the people that I've brought into the studio are people you suggested. So thank you for that. If you are listening on podcast or even on YouTube, subscribe, like, and follow. It pays the bills around here. And with more episodes coming, the bills just increase. If you need help paying the bills, visit livingsmartjewish.org. See how I did that? Full circle. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. And until next time, keep your money kosher. Peace. Living L'chaim.